The espresso martini is one of the most popular cocktails in the world. It's an absolute legend of a drink, it's an icon, it's an enigma, but it's actually really hard to do exceptionally well. Today we're going to deep dive into every aspect of this cocktail and go in search of the ultimate espresso martini. Let's make some coffee cocktails. Welcome back to the Coffee Cocktail channel with me, Dan Fellows. So for those of you who are new here, I'm Dan. I'm the two-time World Coffee and Good Spirits champion. And what this essentially means is I love coffee, I love cocktails, and this channel is all about bringing the two together in a really interesting and creative way. So if this sounds interesting to you, it'd be awesome if you'd consider subscribing. And if you've already subscribed, I appreciate you. So the objective of today is to take into consideration that this drink was made 40 years ago almost, and a lot's changed in the world, and also in the worlds of coffee and cocktails in that time. The original specs, we've proven, were absolutely delicious. But what I want to do today is deep dive into every element of this drink. So the coffee, the spirits, the coffee liqueurs and sweeteners, the techniques available to us, and explore these incredible array of different things we can add and different ways we can make the drink now. What I don't want to do is riff on the drink too heavily, where we change the flavor profile and the DNA of the drink too much. But I want to take everything we love about the espresso martini, the foamy, creamy head, the really natural sweetness without being overpowered by sweetness, the full forward coffee flavor of the kind of familiar coffee flavor notes of sort of chocolate, nuts, that really creamy texture. And I want to build a drink that takes into consideration the 40 years that have passed since the drink was made and really celebrates how far we've come in this time. At the end, I'll share my ultimate espresso martini recipe with you and how you can adapt this for your own flavor preferences. So the first thing we want to do is have a look at the coffee. So when it comes to choosing a coffee for my ultimate espresso martini, I'm in a very lucky position that I get to taste some of the best coffees in the world, a huge range of different coffees. And whenever I do, I do my best to always try and make an espresso martini with as many coffees as humanly possible. So this isn't designed to be a super funky kind of fermenty or floral or interesting espresso martini. What we're looking for is a really solid foundation. Just like the early coffee would have brought to Dick's recipe back in the 1980s, we want to come up to date, have a speciality coffee with a slightly lighter roast, I imagine, and as high a cup quality as we can find, which is going to tie into that classic flavor profile for our espresso martini. So an origin that I always am really blown away by when it comes to these really good foundational flavor notes is Brazil. And when we consider the roast profile, in the 1980s things would have been perhaps a lower quality, darker roasted, so you'd have the bitterness from the roast, probably some sweetness from the coffee because Ili have always bought a good quality grade of coffee, and we'd probably have very low acidity. So today we're going to taste some different coffees from Brazil, which always in my experience have those really solid foundational notes, and we're going to try and find the best brew recipe for these as well as a kind of go-to starting point for which coffee to choose. So I've got three awesome coffees from Brazil about to appear now. And what we're going to do, taste each of them and see really how different each of these coffees are. We've got a pulp natural coffee from Has Been. We've got a red honey from Watch House. And we've got a natural process from Obadiah. They're all incredible roasters. They're all super delicious. I'm going to try each of them individually in a second to see which one's going to be the one we choose. But as long as you choose a roaster with you know, incredible coffee, buying high grade speciality coffee, roasting it to respect the character of the coffee rather than just the kind of roasty flavors, you're gonna be in a good place. So let's give each of these a try now and we'll make a decision on which one we're gonna to use today. So they're all pretty good options, all really sweet, lots of kind of natural flavor in there from the coffee, that, that natural sweetness coming through. To be honest, they're all winners. Any of these would be great options. Pretty much every speciality coffee roaster is going to have a solid chocolatey, either house single origin or a house blend, predominantly made up of a Brazilian coffee in a lot of cases. So seek this out, whichever Brazil you go for, as long as it's a high grade speciality coffee from a credible roaster, I think you've got a really good place to start. So we're going to explore this one, which is Watch House's 1829, which is a Mundo Novo variety, one of the varieties popular in Brazil. It's a red honey process, which is Similar to Pulp Natural, some of the mucilage is left on, gets that really nice kind of natural sweetness from the coffee fruit. And it's a Peabury, which is quite interesting. So it's the smaller beans. And the reason I think this is going to work really well 
is it's almost like hazelnut mousse when you drink it. Got some nice chocolate in there, really sort of creamy texture, and I think it's gonna be a banger. So we're gonna brew some espressos now, and we're gonna do three different extractions to see which one we're gonna use in our espresso martini. We're gonna do a one to one, so 20 grams in, 20 grams out. We're gonna do a one to two, so 20 grams in, 40 grams out. And we're gonna do a one to three, so 20 grams in and 60 grams out. We're gonna taste each one and see which is gonna be best in our espresso martini. From a balance perspective of the taste and also the body, because we wanna keep plenty of body in there for our extractions. So let's taste each one. So we've got our one to one, our one to two, and our one to three ratios of dose to yield. And I'm gonna give each one a taste. Each of these coffees has been ground slightly differently so I can extract them well, ideally aiming for that 18 to 22% range, but this will work on any espresso machine. I'm very lucky to work on a Slayer espresso machine so I can use the pre-brew function to really push our extractions as far as possible, but using these ratios will work on any machine that you have. Just make sure you extract and grind accordingly to get a well-balanced shot where possible. So first up, I'm gonna try the one-to-one, -one, which is a pretty tight ristretto range shot. It's pushed a lot of acidity, really thick body, really heavy and silky, super tasty, would work really well, but I think there is a little bit too much acidity in there. Next up, we're gonna try the one-to-two, which is your sort of, quite often like an industry standard shot, which could bode well. We don't necessarily want people to be changing their grind size when they make this particular drink, an espresso martini, because it's already kind of difficult enough as it is. I mean, it's a banger. All the kind of thick, creamy notes are still there. The texture's incredible. Loads of that chocolate in there. There is a little bit of red fruit coming through, but not in a sort of acidic, vibrant way. More of a kind of dried fruit kind of character coming through. And then for our one to three, Longo, if you want. So we've lost a little bit of texture. The flavor's really, really good, to be honest. Yeah, probably a little bit light. We wanna get more of the intensity from the shot. When we think back to Dick's recipe, which was well ahead of its time, having a darker roast coffee pulled really tight is gonna bring acidity from what would be a low acidity coffee. So lots of sweetness, and then the acidity being pushed by the extraction and pushed back by the roast. So Dick was an incredible barista, whether he realized it or not, but what he's done is very clever. So I'm gonna go for the one to two recipe of our Brazil coffee. This is the red honey. And what we're gonna do is use this, and later on I'm gonna show you a little trick to pull in some of that really nice pleasant bitterness that we've lost by using basically specialty coffee, which isn't a bad thing, but I wanna recreate that kind of really nice low acidity, high sweetness, and some really positive bitterness later on, but keep watching for that. And to summarize, when you're choosing a coffee for an espresso martini, a really good place to start would be a one to two extraction, 20 grams in, 40 grams out, of a really sweet chocolatey coffee from Brazil, either a natural or a pulp natural, or a red honey like we have here. So let's move on to the spirits. So the classic espresso martini spec calls for a good measure of vodka, specifically a Polish vodka like Vibrova, and this is a rye-based vodka. But there's so many different bases for vodka and different spirits, I think the only fair thing for us to do is taste loads. So, well, what have we got here? We've got Boatyard, which is a wheat-based vodka. We've got Crystal Head, which is a corn-based vodka. We've got a potato vodka from Colworth Farm, the Aval Door. We have an apple vodka. Sorry, this is the apple vodka from Foy Valley. We've got a discarded grape skin vodka. We've got a milk-based vodka from Black Cow. And we've also got the cheapest, nastiest vodka I could possibly find. So I'm a bit nervous about this. Some people say vodka's just vodka. I don't agree with that. I'm gonna prove it to you with this rank stuff, but we'll see. So let's get started by tasting some vodka. So what we're looking for in a vodka is a naturally sweet vodka, which is clean, got that nice creamy texture, really kind of balanced and well-built, 
and it doesn't have any of that real rough astringency or burn on the palate. We want something that's going to enliven, enliven, lift our espresso martini and give it a really solid base to complement those really nice creamy chocolatey notes of our coffee. So I'm going to taste the Vibrova first, which is our kind of base reference spirit, a rye vodka. So let's give this a little taste. Pretty delicate on the nose. It's really good. It's got sweetness, not too rough on the palate, really clean, a solid foundation. And I can see why Dick chose this as the base of his espresso martini. Next, we've got Boatyard Vodka, which is a wheat based vodka. A little bit more on the nose, a bit of fruit on the nose as well, a bit of appleiness. Oh, lovely. Yeah, that's like candy floss, really. It's not creamy, but it's silky smooth. I think this takes the lead over the, the Vibrova. Not because the Vibrova is bad, it's very good, really solid foundation, but I just think this has a little bit more going for it. Solid, really, really good. Now we've got the Crystal Head Vodka. Give this a try. This is a corn vodka. I think I might have put a bit too much in there. That's really sweet, really light, quite delicate actually. Yeah, really nice sweetness. I don't think it's got the body we're looking for. It's a really good vodka, not the one I'm looking for for the espresso martini, but super tasty. Next up, we've got a potato vodka. This one's from Colworth Farm Distillery in Cornwall. It's called Aval d'Or. I do love potato vodka, to be honest. Generally speaking, I love the creaminess it brings. Let's have a look at this one. Yeah, really clean nose. Oh, that's always the body I'm looking for. Really creamy, really easy going, warm but not hot. It's got really silky coating character, natural sweetness. This is my favorite so far. We have an apple-based vodka from Foy Valley, another Cornish vodka. As you'd expect, very crisp, very clean. It's got a little bit of warmth in there, really nice. It's really refreshing. I think this would be a good summer vodka, but again, we want heavy, creamy, clean, luxurious vodka for our espresso martini, so I'm gonna leave this on the table and move on to the next one, which is discarded grape skin vodka. So I'm a really big fan of this brand. Let's have a little taste of their vodka and see if it ticks the creamy, sweet, non-astringent box. Really light, really delicate, it's super tasty. I want to have a martini of this right away, but for an espresso martini, I don't think it's got the heaviness or the intensity we're looking for, but again, very tasty. Black cow vodka made from milk. An immediate downside of this is I doubt it's vegan friendly. In fact, it's definitely not vegan friendly. But let's have a little taste. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, it's really creamy, really good kind of soft fruit in there, really creamy, really kind of natural sweetness in there. This is a really good option. I think this would be about here, so in line with the wheat vodka, the boatyard. The downside of this is it's not vegan, so we're not gonna put it in our recipe, and it doesn't quite have the creaminess that we've got from the potato vodka. So, now, I've gotta try this one. The cheapest, nastiest vodka I could find. Oh, it reminds me of being a teenager, but not in a good way. Just like nail varnish remover, paint stripper. Oh, it's intense, it's horrible. Don't use it. Vodka is not just vodka, seriously. So I think taking everything into consideration, I think we should go for the amazing potato vodka from Colworth Farm Distillery, the Aval d'Or. But I'm not against adding other spirits to the espresso martini, as long as they don't change the DNA of what it's doing. So, because we've got the creaminess coming from the potato vodka, which is banging, I also want to add a little bit of a vanilla note. So to do this, we're going to go, or at least taste, some aged white rum. So this is Diplomatico Planas, and I'm going to give this a little taste now. So Planas is an aged white rum from Venezuela, and I think 
this is going to be a really good addition to our espresso martini because it's got all the flavors we want in there. So yeah, loads of vanilla on the nose. It's got some of those sort of fruit esters. It smells kind of like peachy kind of raspberry as well, but not overpoweringly so, just underlying. So nice, it's white chocolate. There's like a ripe banana in there as well. Really creamy. And I think paired together, these two are gonna work wonders together. So we've got creaminess from potato vodka, vanilla, white chocolate notes from the Planas, aged white rum. And I think that's gonna work really well in there. So I won't bore you with all my testing data and show you this, but in my experience, equal parts by weight of espresso and spirit, assuming it's 40%, work really, really well for balance. So what we're looking at so far is 40 grams of coffee, espresso extracted at one to two from 20 grams dry dose, and 40 grams of spirit. We're gonna go 20 grams of each so that we've got a nice balance between the two. And then we're gonna move on to the sweetener of the espresso martini. So when it comes to the sweetener in espresso martini, it's always a bit of a difficult one. So you could use coffee liqueurs, you could use syrup, you could use a flavored syrup or a flavored liqueur to bring something different. But what we wanna to do today is bring just more of those flavors we're already looking for in the drink. So all of these would do a wonderful job. And these are the highest scoring coffee liqueurs when I did a coffee liqueur tasting of about 20 coffee liqueurs, I keep saying that word, which I'll link above and in the description. But all of them do slightly different things. However, 40 years ago, coffee pretty much would have been just coffee. But today, we're looking at a really high level of detail, a really granular approach to where coffee comes from, how it's grown, how it's produced, who produces it, the hands it passes, the process it goes through, and the effect that has on the cup. So coffee liqueur is amazing. It has very much a place in an espresso martini. But what I want to do today is really focus on this particular coffee. So our red honey, Peabury Mundo Nova from Brazil. So as much as these coffee liqueurs are incredible and they will feature in our how to make an espresso martini at home video, we're not gonna use them today because they actually bring different coffee flavors because it's a different coffee to the one in our espresso martini. No bad thing. So these are just gonna sit over here for a minute and rest until next time. And when it comes to the sugar content of an espresso martini, all of my testing has found a pretty much an average of around about 10 grams of sugar per serve. And an espresso martini is usually about 100 grams. So monin syrups are two to one. So in order to find 10 grams of sugar, you could use 15 grams of syrup because you just multiply it by 1.5 and that's the total amount you'd need for 10 grams. So again, this is an amazing product that definitely has its space in a huge range of espresso martinis. But because we're focusing so finely on the micro details of the coffee and the spirits, what I wanna do is create something that really celebrates that. What I have made is a coffee saccharum for our sweetness. And also brings some really positive bitterness, just like the Illy coffee would have done in Dick's original recipe. So coffee saccharum is essentially extracting the oils from leftover coffee pucks, which I've got here, which are from all of the kind of tests I've done. So what I've done is take 300 grams of our spent coffee pucks, covered them with 150 grams of golden caster sugar, which brings a really clean sweetness, and 150 grams of light muscovado sugar, which has more of a kind of treacly, rounded, vanilla -y sweetness. Left this to do its thing, mixed it all together with a fork. It then turns into a sort of slurry, which is really oily as the moisture comes out of the coffee puck. And then when we've done that, take 150 grams of our vodka, 150 grams of our rum, pour those in the bowl, pass it through a paper filter, and then when we're left, with this incredibly intense, bitter, sweet coffee saccharum. Because this is literally made with this, 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 golden caster sugar and light caster sugar, it's a perfect sweetener for our espresso martini. And because it's just about a one-to-one -one ratio of sugar to water in the end, I know that 20 grams of this is gonna give us around about 10 grams of sugar, which is what we're looking for in our recipe. So to give it a little taste, Super sweet, quite bitter, but in a positive way. It's got those kind of slightly roastier notes coming through from the coffee, which essentially are the higher end of the extraction, but super positive, really kind of clean, 
complements this and this really well because it's essentially made out of that and it's going to be the perfect sweetener for our ultimate espresso martini. So now we've got our coffee, our spirits and our sweetener all sorted, you could easily stop there and you'd make an absolutely delicious espresso martini and historically that would have been kind of all of our ingredients. But there is one more thing I like to include in an espresso martini and that's salt. And I know this sounds a little bit weird, but I tend to use saline solution for a lot of coffee cocktails and find it really brings everything together. So to test this, I carried out a series of tests and I slowly added the salt to different espresso martinis and increased the percentage as we went. So I started with no salt and obviously it was a delicious espresso martini. I upped that to half a gram, which is 0.5% of the beverage weight. The full beverage being 100 grams, so 40, 60, 80, 100. This was delicious, couldn't taste the salt, so I kept going. Pushed up to 1% or one gram. This was amazing, super delicious. And then when we pushed to 1.5 grams, you could start to taste the salt. So I wanted to just push back a little bit. So I settled on one gram of our saline solution, which is made of one part good quality salt and five parts boiling water. Just dissolve it together. And that's my final ingredient in our espresso martini. So before I start talking about the techniques and different ways of making an espresso martini, when I'm evaluating each drink, there's three things I'm looking for. The first of which being texture, so how the drink looks, how it feels in the mouth. And we're looking for that really nice sort of cascading, creamy, foamy texture, kind of looks like a Guinness, feels a bit like a cappuccino and super smooth, tight foam. We're going to look at taste. So how the drink comes together, how all the different components work together. And also we're going to include dilution in this. So we don't want the drink to be overly watered down, but we also don't want it to be too intense. And then finally, we're going to look at temperature. So of all the espresso martinis I've tested, I've yet to find one that is better as it warms up. So the colder, the better. We know that shaking an espresso martini can bring it down to zero degrees, even into negatives. So as low as minus five degrees. And this is the sort of temperature we want to aim for for our espresso martinis. As they warm up, they tend to feel a little bit too sweet, just like when you've got a glass of Coke. As it warms up, it tastes super sweet and uncomfortably sweet. The same with ice cream. If you've ever eaten melted ice cream, it's damn sweet. So we want to serve this as cold as possible. And we're going to start by testing a three piece shaker versus a Boston tin. So for our first test, we're going to test this, which is a three piece tin, classic cocktail shaker. A lot of people have these, they go together like so. And we're going to compare this with the two part shaker, Boston tin. I like tin on tin. I just find it's a little bit more robust, a little bit more sturdy, easier to separate. And the advantage of this is we have a lot more headroom so we can fit more ice and we can get a little bit more motion in the ocean when we're shaking our espresso martini. So now I'm going to knock up two espresso martinis in each of these. So pretty difficult to do a fair test here, but we're going to shake these until the shakers start to frost over. I don't trust my tins enough to shake them together. So I'm going to shake this one first. So that's got that really nice frosted layer on the outside, straight onto the three piece. <clears throat> so both super cold to the touch. Gonna get some frozen glasses because we want everything nice and cold. And as per Dick's original recipe, we're gonna single strain each one. So first of all, from the Boston. Ooh, moosey. Looks really good to be fair. And I'm weighing this to see how much liquid is in the glass and we've got 145, so 45% dilution, which is pretty high really. And then in our three piece, <clears throat> already this is harder to get all the liquid out. Interestingly, this has got lower dilution quite considerably actually. So we're looking at about 130 grams. Taste, we know we've got more dilution from the Boston. Temperature, we'll measure each. 
And as I said, pretty difficult to test this completely fairly. This is shaken for as long as I would shake it if I were making it for a guest. And on the Boston, we're getting down to about minus five. And then in terms of the three piece, we're settling at around about minus four and a half. In fact, that's sneaking up to minus five. These seem much the same temperature, to be honest. And then, taste. <clears throat> so this has got shards of ice. And it's a little bit on the low intensity side of things. Great texture there. And then this, which is our three piece shaker. It's big, you can probably hear that on the microphone. Big shards of ice, really smooth texture, but you can see lower layer of foam. And I think the dilution on this is about perfect. So 30% is fine. Tastes great, bit crunchy, lacking texture. So from these two drinks, I've learned actually quite a lot. So first of all, we wanna make sure we do fine strain moving forward as long as the texture is still okay. But we also wanna reduce the dilution of our Boston tin shake and drink. So for the next test, I'm gonna fine strain and we're also gonna freeze our spirits. And we'll see how we get there. So we've got our frozen spirits, got our potato vodka and our Diplomatica Planas aged white rum. So by using colder ingredients, I'm hoping we're gonna have a lower dilution this time, aiming for that 30%. So that's really nicely frosted up. Gonna get our frozen glass out of the freezer. And this time, breaking tradition, we're gonna fine strain. I've got this nice, deep, fine strainer, which means we can get a quicker flow. I don't think we're losing any texture there, it looks awesome. We're looking better on the dilution as well. So let's have a taste of our Next stage, espresso martini, with fine straining and frozen spirits. Oh, texture, temperature, taste. Texture, incredible, it's super foamy. It's got that really smooth, kind of silky texture. No big bubbles, lots of just really small ones. Microfoam, you could say, like a good cappuccino. It's got the cascade thing going on. Temperature, let's measure. So temperature, we're even colder. We're at minus six, just over, which is really good. And then we've obviously lost a little bit of the dilution from the last time, which is a good thing. So we're around about 25 to 30%, which is exactly where we want to be. I like 25%. I think 30% is really good for the general public when you don't want to be too intense, but I like coffee. I like all these booze, boozes, spirits. And I bloody love that. That's delicious. I think we've made it. Thanks for making it this far. I think we've found my ultimate espresso martini. So the last thing to do is go through each step. I'm gonna make the full drink again. Talk through each different individual part. And if you've skipped the whole video and you've arrived here, hey, welcome, how you doing? So let's make my ultimate espresso martini. First of all, we start with the Boston tin. Give us plenty of headroom to shake our cocktail. Allow us plenty of room for ice. So. In we go with 40 grams of Brazilian espresso, high grade speciality coffee. Looking for a coffee with those chocolatey, hazelnut moussey notes, really creamy, naturally sweet. Not too dark roast, not too light roast. We want a nice balanced espresso. 20 grams in, 40 grams out. Next up, we want our frozen spirits. We've got two. First of all, we've got our potato vodka, which is Colworth Farm Aval vodka. And then we've got our aged white rum, which is Diplomatico Planas. Gonna go 20 grams each, 20 mils each. This is gonna be frozen. So this is to reduce that dilution of the drink, aiming for around about 25 to 30% dilution. If you like it super low intensity, you can shake for longer, increase your dilution. If you like it stronger, you can chill everything down and shake a little bit quicker. 20 grams, 20 mils of our Diplomatico Planas. Super delicious, kind of white chocolatey, a little bit of banana in there, some kind of fruit esters, really tasty rum. Got loads of creaminess coming from the potato vodka, from that base, 
quite a neutral spirit, but also lots of sweetness in there. We've got our coffee saccharum, made from leftover coffee pucks of this very coffee, infused with light muscovado sugar, golden castor sugar, and also each of the spirits. Gonna go 20 ml of that, which equates to around about 10 grams of sugar, which is fairly standard for an espresso martini. And then finally, we're gonna add 1% saline solution to the weight of the drink. So there's 100 grams in here. Gonna add one gram of our saline solution at one to five, which just brings everything together. Doesn't let the drink taste of salt, but just harmonizes everything. Really makes it pop. And then 200 grams of ice, double the beverage weight. Gonna give this a really good shake over ice. In the words of the legendary B. Bradsall, shake it like you hate it. Until you get that nice frost on the tin. You can see it's got that amazing texture already. You're gonna strain this into a frozen glass, like so. And we're gonna fine strain to get rid of any of those shards of ice. But make sure it's nice and vigorously poured so you get plenty of that foamy, moussey, rich cappuccino-like texture that everyone loves with the Guinness-like cascade. Super fine foam. Oh. And there we have my ultimate espresso martini. Cheers. It's so nice. Tastes like chocolate. There's some vanilla in there, some kind of hazelnut moussey kind of notes in there. It's well balanced without being too sweet or lacking sweetness. I think everything ties in really well together. The texture's lovely. For me, it's the ultimate espresso martini. Give it a try. Let me know what you do to tweak this. You can add all sorts of different things to an espresso martini. We can play with different coffees. We can play with different spirits. You can play with different sweeteners. And it's just such a fantastic drink. So I owe this to Dick Bradsall, absolute hero. Thank him for creating the espresso martini in the first place. Big thanks to B. Bradsall, his amazing daughter, who gave me all the information about the espresso martini and what the aim of it was. Make sure you like the video if you've enjoyed this. Make sure you subscribe below and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks very much for watching. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.